Well, welcome to the latest edition of Trojan Football Talk. I'm your host, Tom Vartani, and today's show brought to you by American Credit Union for everything, for everything located next to Little Caesars at 3944 Route 281 in Cortland. By the Cortland Voice, the exclusive media partner of Trojan Football Talk. For all your local news and sports in Cortland County at no cost to you, check out CortlandVoice.com. By the Royal Auto Group on Route 281 in Cortland, the home of no hassle, no razzle-dazzle. Check them out at RoyalAutoGroup.com. By Yeaman Real Estate at the entrance of Yeaman Park off I-81, exit 11 in Cortland. By DJ Philly C. Make your wedding, party, or event extra special with the best DJ in the area. Contact DJ Philly C. at 607-745-4346. By Nikki C's Hometown Pizzeria and Meatball Shop on Route 281 next to Hobos in Homer. Find them online for fast, secure ordering or call 607-749-5300. They have a unique menu with dietary-specific options. Nikki C's, your grab-and-go specialist. By Graftex, located on Elm Street in Cortland. Founded in 1984, they provide custom screen printing and embroidery for teams and local businesses. Graftex continues its dedication to servicing customers' needs for innovative graphic designs, custom and printed apparel, and quality service. They are easy to contact at 1 800 417 7791. By Seven Valley Agency at 18 Tompkins Street in Cortland for all your personalized insurance services. Give them a call at 607 753 1821 or check them out online at sevenvalleyagency.com. Seven Valley Agency, where your money matters, our advice counts. By Isaac Merker Studio, handling all your photographic needs in Central New York since 1982 at 74 Hamlin Street in Cortland. Give them a call at 607-756-0849 or check them out online at isaacmerker.com or on their Facebook page. By m and Deli, located on Central Avenue in Cortland, open Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. till 3 p.m. m and has breakfast sandwiches, bakery items, and daily lunch specials. They are also available for catering. Check out their Facebook page for more information. Stop by or call 607-753-TO-GO. That's 753-8646. And look for their new food truck in the spring of 2022. By Crop Growers LLP, the first choice in crop insurance located in Homer. Contact KC Slade at 607-591-2460 for more information. And by the First National Bank of Dryden at 12 South Main Street in Homer. Safe, secure, and locally owned for all your banking needs. For more information, stop by, call 662-4179, or check them out online at drydenbank.com. Well, you may have heard 1984 mentioned in there and stuff, and that kind of, this is kind of cool. We're uh, into the off-season with the Trojans now, of course, and uh, so it's time to, you know, we got things coming up. We're going to talk to opposing coaches, what it was like preparing to play against Homer down the road. We're going to work on some of those uh, podcasts. And also the chance to go back and do, Again, alumni, and as you know, the first time go around, alumni went back went back as far as 1972 there with Bob Avery, and of course, then we got guys from the 70s and 80s and 90s, and of course, some of the more recent years. Well, this is a guy we've always talked about. Anytime we talk about receivers, we always mentioned he was the leading receiver all time at Homer during his uh, two-year career, and he's unique. He got to play for Coach Norris in his final season in 1984, the coach was involved, and he was uh, a junior that season. And then he was the part of the uh, team that began the 29-game unbeaten streak in 1985 under Paul Beladoff. So, uh, again, the whole Trojans' all-time leading receiver joining us today is Jim Curry. Jim, welcome. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Heard a couple of these in the past few weeks. I just stumbled across this, and I listened to a for about four or five hours one night, listening to Larry Brady and Coach Seedlick talking about the good old days. So I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. Glad yeah. to be here. And like I said, you're part of, you're part, we just celebrated the uh, sixth sectional championship this uh, season with the uh, Trojans. And uh, of course, for you, you were part of the first two sectional championship teams. Yeah. And, uh, so you, you just missed out on the state title by a season, but uh, you, you oh, were part yeah. of the, the team that helped set that up. <laughs> Yeah, back in the day, they let the let the writers do the voting, I guess. And uh, I think we finished third my senior year. Um, and then the boys took it home the next year. We knew they were loaded up and ready to go. They, they had a, a great squad. Um, 
you know, we finished third, we were 10 and all. I, I think what helped them is they went out with a real big bang when they won that sectional title. They, they took it home like 44 to seven or they crushed, uh, I think it was Holland Patton in the finals. Yeah, we had a rough go of it with uh, BVS. We pr probably played the worst game we played in our whole high school careers that night in the dome, uh, you know, in the finals. I think the final was 13-7 uh, or something like that. You're, you're dead on with both both those scores. Yeah, it was 44-7 to seven when they won the state title in 86, uh, you know, the second of the two straight years of 10-0 uh, runs. And it was, but see, a lot of people talk about when they talk about the sectional championship, you talk about, you know, more recent ones, of course, are, you know, more fresh in people's minds, but everybody talks about that first sectional championship and that VVS game in the dome. That was just, you know, a, a pass play set up, you know, was the, was kind of the decider and they, but that's what everybody points to. A lot of people talk about that was, you know, a, you know, one of those seminal moments in, in Homer Trojan football history that win in the dome, that first title. Yeah. When I come home, you know, it's it's guaranteed I'm going to be out somewhere or be at the store or run into people. And that tends to be the first thing that comes up, boy, is I remember that night in the Dome. You know, it's a lot of people can remember what they were doing or where they were. And, it, you know, it was a great moment. I wish that we didn't make it come down to the, the final seconds like that. And, uh, you know, it, it's you know it's it's a great thing to hang your hat on and we got Homer on the map finally with that first undefeated season it's just uh we, we we had some some a lot of yards that night and we you know our tailback had over 200 yards that night and we moved the ball well we just couldn't get every we didn't have a real good week of practice that week I'll be honest with you we uh it was real cold and it it was, it was, we practiced over at Cornell a couple of days on the turf to get ready for it. And it was freezing and snowing. And I think maybe just a touch, we might've been a little overconfident going into that game, uh, coming off of, we routed Salve in the, the, the ninth game, you know, to make the dome, we routed them and we thought, you know, Hey, this team's got two losses. What, you know, we thought we were just going to walk all over them, I think. And, uh, we got smacked in the mouth real early and we found out that, Oh, we're, in, we're in for, we're in for a long night tonight. So yeah, it was, it was a great night and some good calls went down. You know, it, it we, uh, we set them up pretty good that night on, you know, we ran a little hitching, we ran a little out pattern right before with like a minute left. And, uh, you know, he, he, I got out of bounds and stopped the clock and we called the timeout and, Coach Bells came out and he said, all right, you know why we ran that out? And I was like, yep, we're going to run 82 and go now. He looked right at Doob and he, I call him Doob, Dave Medeiros, everyone knows him. His nickname is Doob. And uh, he said, all right, it's going to be there. You just got to put it there. And uh, sure enough, it, you know how they say uh, when you're in a zone or you're, you're, you're really feeling things slow down. When I think back, I can remember you know, I, I did my little out and I came up and, and the ball was already started when I looked back and, and it was it was like it was moving in slow motion. It was just coming in sections to me and I put my hands up and it was perfect pass hit me dead stride. The D backs, I think it was Gary Oliver and Billy Tiller at BVS. They collided. I kind of jumped up in between them. And they collided and they both went down. So I had the whole sidelines to myself, but it was like slow motion. That place just erupted. It was, it was the loudest. I've never heard anything like that in a game that I've been involved in, but real cool, real cool night. And uh, I'm just glad I caught it. I, I can say that. You don't <laughs> want to go down in history on the other side of that. I can tell you that one. Um, so yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. Like you said, uh, well, I take it, did you get involved in your love for football back in the day? I mean, there still was youth football back then. Is that where you kind of got hooked in and really? Oh, yeah, football? Homer. That, that's where it all started. We had such, I know they probably still do. I, you know, I'm down here in West Virginia now, but our youth programs were phenomenal. We started in like third grade, fourth grade, and, uh, you know, starting on Bob Drummond's. I remember playing for Bob Drummond's and, uh, you know, Ray Doty, a bunch of those guys are just 
our small, we called it small fry. What a great program. And, and that's where I learned everything, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. But it goes back, we, we couldn't get enough. We couldn't get enough football. On Sundays, we'd play over at the elementary school with the, old, with the older guys. Excuse me, I'm sorry about that. Got a, got a chocolate lab in the background. She wants outside. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let her out here in a second. You'll be all right. Oh, but yeah, that's where it all started. That small fry, that small fry stuff, playing three, four years of that and big turnouts, big turnouts, great program. We'd have it over at the junior high intermediate school out back and it was, it was big time. So what was it like when you got, you know, you have to, uh, when you started at that young age, were there guys that were playing on the varsity at that time that you looked up to that were like your guys that like, well, I want to be like this guy someday? Oh, absolutely. And uh, you'll rem- you'll know this name. I believe you've had him on here before. Um, and Larry will, Larry Brady will tell you this too, is that was like my guy. I wanted to be just like Larry. And uh, he, he taught me that we used to play with those guys the old I mean I was like fifth sixth grade seventh grade and they'd let us get in on their games over behind the elementary school on Sundays with Larry and uh, uh, this guy Kraut Gray and Joel Mercer and and you know maybe Johnny Norris was over there um bunch of the older guys the varsity players and they'd let us come out if you could run with them but it was tackle so if you you're getting hit and I looked up to Larry and he, you know, he was the epitome of class and he hustled and he, he was just a great athlete. And I wanted to be him growing up. So whatever he had to say, I froze and I just stared. I listened when, when he spoke, I listened, let's put it that way. And, and uh, I used na- my, one of my neighbors was Jeff Austin. You remember him a great tailback back in the day and uh those were a couple guys that I really looked up to. And, and that's the way it works in homers. You got to, there, there's guys that you just want to work hard and, and be like them someday. And uh, it was awesome. You know, you could be playing with them on Sunday and then that next Friday night, there they are out in front of all those people. And I just wanted to be one of those guys someday. And it kind of all worked out. So how the progression go after that? I mean, you went to, you know, got, to play, modified, you know, modified at the junior high, uh, at least nowadays. And I, I'm, I'm not surprised it probably was the same way back in those days. That's where you kind of started learning what Homer did, how Homer played, because you kind of started learning some of those Homer basics back oh, in yeah. junior high. What do you remember from those junior high days? I remember playing for Coach Baden. Um, seventh grade was the end of uh, your small fry stuff. And believe it or not, I didn't play football in eighth grade. I don't know what happened or what, what I missed a something, but uh, ninth grade, I played modified with um, coach John Baden. He he was the baseball coach. And uh, that's where I learned. I learned all about uh, Homer was kind of focused on the tailback 56, boom, 55, boom, these power. I right power. I left. Um, But uh, I could I could run and I could catch the ball. I was a wing back uh, when I was when I was first starting out, but I, I'd catch some balls out of the, you know, running some patterns as a Z. They called it the Z at the time. Your wing back is like your slot receiver, um, sets off the line a little bit, and and that's when I learned that uh, you're only going to get two or three, maybe four balls thrown your way, but uh, it's all about hard work and. Um, the guys that work the hardest and, and listen, they're the ones that are going to be on the field. And uh, I just was told from Larry growing up is always hustle. And when it's time to put in the work, put in the work and you'll, it'll end up being there when you get, when it's all said and done. But coach Baden kind of started it off and he, he, he taught me the ropes, you know, when I was a youngster and then uh, we moved into uh, JV is when, I kind of started to blossom between ninth and 10th grade is when I figured out that, man, I, I can, I can run pretty fast. I, I got some good speed here. Um, and I played, I played a little bit of tailback that year when our tailback was hurt, Bruce Turner, he had some ankle issues and, and um, 
I didn't, I did okay, but I didn't like getting hit that. You, you get blasted, and, you know, you give me the ball 25 times. But that's when I met Coach Paul Belinoff, is uh, 10th grade is when uh, my first introduction, we, we had a great JV team. I don't know if you want me to go down through that path, but um, we ran it off pretty good. And in uh, 10th grade, we are undefeated. But the, the thing I'll take from that is um, playing that tailback position, of like three or four games. I did well, but man, you get smashed pretty good playing tailback. I got some good shots. <laughs> Some of the better shots I ever took in high school was in tenth grade. So that I like say get get through the JV season. Nineteen eighty four, your junior, your first year with the, uh, you know, your first year with the varsity, and of course, as it ends up turning out, ends up being uh, Coach Mike Norris's final season. That year, you you're still you know hold, you've got one of those several guys that have done it now that. Uh, Caught three touchdown passes in a ball game, but you're the you and Mike Hall were the first yep. two to do it. Twenty years after Paul Gower did it in '64, and then uh-huh. it was the '84. You two guys did, and that was the uh, that was your one of your first years with two very good quarterbacks. Uh, Tim Warren was winding on his career, but he still holds the uh, tie for the season single season record of 17 touchdown passes that year. You caught 10 touchdown passes that year, and yeah. The first first of two years, we can talk a little bit more about some of those uh, stats um, as we uh, get going along here. We can do a little bit more about that. But uh, again, your first year, um, what was it like? You know, f- first uh, preseason with a uh, you know with Mike Norris. Let me tell you, you think you're you think you're in shape, you think you're ready to go. I don't know if you know this, but back in the day, they probably still do this. We had to work out three times a week in the summer, kind of off the record type of thing. Uh, No coaches involved, wink, wink, you know, up at the high school. um, (laughs) We'd have to go there at seven o'clock. That was my first introduction to the weight room. And uh, I don't know if anyone's coach was known as Iron Mike. And there's a reason for that. I was a string bean at the time, <laughs> you know, 130 pounds. I don't know about the weight room, but he he taught me that this isn't going to come easy. This is this is work time. This is we were there at seven o'clock in the morning, three days a week. We'd left and then we'd take, make that trek out back to the track. And now it's time to get in shape because if there's one thing Homer football is known for is we're going to. We're going to be in shape and you're not going to outlast us. You're not going to outwork us because we, there was 40 guys there three days a week. And it was, it wasn't just hangout time. It was, let's get ready. Let's put in the work. And then when we went out in that track, there was guys dropping, there was guys just struggling, but Hey, that's what you got to do. And it was no nonsense. It was a little different from 10th grade with Coach Bells. And, it was, it, you know, you don't talk when Coach Norris is talking. I, I learned that early on. I learned that very early on when he stopped the drill one time. And uh, he told me, you know, I don't – he just he just put me on blast in front of everyone, you know. I, he, you're a good player and you're, you're, you're a great neighbor and you're, you're, you're going to do really well. But there's one thing you're going to learn is uh, – Nobody talks when I'm talking. You just, you're going to sit there and listen and go take a couple laps and think about it and come back here and uh, be ready to get back into it. And I, ever since then, I just remember now, just when he's talking or he's going over something, just hold it until the end and ask the question. Don't, don't talk when coach is talking. You'll, you'll, you'll learn the hard way. <laughs> So we said that first season, uh, your first season, of course, we said, again, that was Coach Norris's final season. Uh, mm-hmm. Seven and two started out good with three wins, beat Jordan Alberts 33 to six and uh, shout out wins, a six nothing win over West Hill, followed by yep. an eight nothing over Fowler. Or, and then ironically, if we say two losses all year, they came the, the next two weeks. They were back to yeah. back weeks, uh, losing seven, six to uh, Marcellus and then 12, seven to uh, Bishop Grimes before closing out the season with another a three game, uh, four game win streak, which we'll talk about. Those, those two games there, that's the only two games I lost. We lost in our high school career. So they came in back to back weeks. Um, 
we were rolling along. We had, we were young that that junior year. We were young. We had a lot of the guys from uh, a lot of the sophomores were up from JV. A lot of tenth graders: Mike Jasper, PJ Dwyer, uh, Randy Ames. I think our whole line was sophomores except for uh, Paul Suits. <laughs> so to put in for that '86, we had their line in '84. Those guys had been through the wars by the time they got to that state title year. They were 10th graders starting up front. You know, we lost 7-6 and 12-7. And uh, we were ranked probably top 15 going into those game, that first game at Marcellus. Just a cold night. We couldn't run the ball like, you know, we could later in the year and that following year. We just didn't. Those guys were inexperienced up front, you know. We, Tim and I couldn't get anything going. He might have been, I think he might have been 0 for 8 that night with two picks. He had his worst game. I had my worst game. It was just the perfect storm. Uh, but by the end of the year that year, you know, we finished up 7 and 2. I was looking back through some of the archives. I think we outscored opponents like 219 to 60. And, you know, 60 points in nine games is that's seven points a game. We, a couple of coaches said by the end of the year, we were the best team in the league. And I, I believe we were. I think Bishop Grimes went on to sectionals and it was it was I went to the game and it was like a really bad game. It was a like a seven seven tie, the sectional final. I think we could have stomped both. But we were young. We were still we were green. You know, we had some good seniors. We just didn't have that. That group of big guys, the big, big guys up front that could, you know, play smash mouth. And, you know, it cost us a couple against a couple bigger teams, Marcellus and Bishop Grimes. But that was coaches last year, Coach Norris's last year. And I really think we could have won the sectionals that year. We just dropped those by the end of the year. I mean, we destroyed Salve in the last game of the year. I, mean, I think it was like 44 to 15 or something crazy. We lit them up pretty good, and their coach after the game said, I'll tell you right now, Homer's the best team in this league. I don't care what who they lost to earlier in the year, but right now, no one wants to play them. And we, we kind of knew after that night, okay, man, it's time to go put in the work because something special can happen next year if we, we just get going on this thing. Yeah, so to cap off that, the final run for Coach Norris, yeah, four straight wins, 34 nothing over Phoenix. Then a tight 17-14 win over Skinny Atlas. Yep. But then it was 47-6 over Mexico and 41-15. You're very close. 41-15 against Salve. Uh, so, and I know as it got closer, he knew what he was doing, but you guys didn't get a hint on because I know one thing we talked about uh, before we started doing the podcast was uh, you had a very special moment with Coach Norris as, I the, did. as those last games came. Talk about that. I thought that was just great to hear that was a great story so yeah um coach and I I mean he, we had a special you know I did things a little differently and coach Basilic will tell you I was pretty uh pretty spirited guy I did things a little differently the wide receiver way I mean I watched too much tv maybe you know I was a little uh rambunctious and like to put on a little bit of a show when things were going on and coach would rein me in and we had we had some good talks and some private talks and um he called me down out of class one day uh, after the season probably uh this January February time may might even have been March and he pulled me in and he we sat down we closed the door downstairs in the office and he said hey uh, I just want to let you know we're you're going to hear this, you know, it's not really out there yet, but uh, I'm going to retire. And I was like, coach, you can't, we're set up. This is it now. It, I mean, we're loaded. We're loaded. We're ready to go. I mean, we had everything. Our team from 10th grade was now seniors. We smashed. We had a, we, we, it was all lined up. We finished the year great. We had all those sophomores. We're now juniors. We all had that year of varsity experience and, I, I was like kind of going he, in it. He's like, I know. He's like, I, I'm, it, it's the time. It's the right time. I've been doing this a long time. And I think the program is where I want to leave it now. It's, it's, it's right where it needs to be. 
Um, you guys, I think we're going to go on a good run. We have a lot of talent here. I haven't seen this kind of talent in a long, long time, if ever. And if I was, the, if there was going to be one time to leave or a perfect time to leave the program in good hands, it would be right now. And he's like, I, I, I just, it's a per, I'm being offered, you know, and it's just time to step away and be with family. And, you know, he's, he wished me luck and he said, you'll be fine. And coach, he said, it's not announced yet, but coach Belladoff, you probably figure he's going to be the guy. And we all knew that once coach Norris stepped down, but people don't know this. He, he kind of knew he could have stuck around and wrote it out for that. He knew what was coming. He, he did, but he, he, that's how the type of guy he was, how humble he was. He, he stepped away when he knew that program was at its peak. It was, it was all lined up to go on a great run and, you know, he, he wanted to retire. I think he was about 55, 56 at the time, and he wanted to go enjoy family, and he deserved it. But I appreciated that time and that talk with him. He was my neighbor, so it wasn't our last talk. You know, we, we had little meetings on uh, Sundays and Saturday mornings. I'd go to walk my dog down to the junior high, and I, I lived up the street from, from him on Clinton Street, so that senior year we had many discussions out in the front yard on Clinton Street about the night before he'd be in the wing somewhere watching that game he'd tell me what I did wrong and what I did right and what I needed to work on but yeah he gave me a little insight on what was to come and I, I enjoyed that you know, I, you know I had great respect for him and he he's the one that taught me that you're not getting there you're not setting records and going on to college if you don't work hard and and, and just do things the right way. And that's unusual for a coach. I mean, yeah, Coach Norris, right up to the time he died, he was every year, Coach Pasito would try to get him to come over and at least talk to the guys one game and, you know, or before one game or come to one practice or something, they used to always kind of, you know, but that, yeah, there aren't many head coaches that would walk away knowing I got, I've got a loaded team. He know. Handing, and I'm handing it off to the next guy in line instead of, you know, going in with an, Bob, an empty cupboard the next year. Oh, there was, yeah, he, he definitely knew. We talked about that and he, he talked about not becoming overconfident and, and just make sure every week the work, the work, the work, the summer coming up, he's like get in that weight room tomorrow. It's time. It's time to start working for next year. But anyone that doesn't, he, he could have stuck around and he knew that he knew what was coming. It, it was, it was no secret. He, he knew. <laughs> I'll go to, I'll go, I'll go to my grave knowing that he knew that we were going to do this. So. And of course that was Tim Warren's final season and yes, uh, sir. Uh, completed, you know, 41 of 82 passes, 17 touchdowns. And of course of those 17, you caught 10 of them. He threw for 696 yards and, uh, you had 21 of those catches for 432 yards and uh, 10 touchdowns. Uh, so, I mean, you, uh, you had a nice rapport with, uh, with Tim. And of course he ended up three, all number three, all time, you know, went to... career passing list. And uh, mm -hmm. so, so you had one good quarterback on that end. And then I think, of course, that we said, then the next year, if everything turns around, you know, a new coach and coach Beldoff won his first 25 games. If you want to get technically, he won 25 straight games. You guys, uh, Sure did. You uh, this was this was a team that you know recorded seven straight shutouts to open up uh, the Belladoff era in 1985. Uh, 38 nothing over Jordan Albert, 20 nothing over West Hill, 34 nothing over Fowler, 35 nothing over Marcellus, 46 nothing over Bishop Grimes, 39 nothing over Phoenix, and 41 nothing over Skinny Atlas. Mexico's the, the Mexico game is the one I want to kind of joke about more than anything because of the fact that. And Mexico had the audacity to score the first six points, and that didn't set well with Coach Beladoff because you guys ended up beating uh, Mexico nope. sixty-three to six that day. And uh, I got a good story about that that game. Um, I got a good one. You'll enjoy this. But uh, see, leading up to that week, uh, we got a little too much press. I think we got too much uh, good press. We were actually on the front page of the sports section of the USA Today that week, I, I heard Coach Pasilic talking about this. Um, 
starting out seven and oh and we were on the front page of uh the sports section there was 800 teams left in the united states that were unbeaten and there was only five left that were unscored upon after seven weeks of the high school season and uh you must have read that article one too many times because <laughs> sure enough we had some close calls coming into that you know throughout the season you know intercepting someone at the goal line Paul Suits coming up with a big hit at the goal line, causing a fumble, missed field goal, blocked field goal. We we got we had some lucky, but sure enough, they scored. And uh, it was a crazy play. It was like the quarterback, he rolled out one way and he turned around, he reversed field, and he just it was the perfect storm. And he was it was some crazy, he went down the sidelines and everyone got cut off. I I I chased him down, but you know, I didn't catch up to him until like the one or two yard line. But after that, uh, it, it it wasn't a good day for them because I do remember we rarely on offense played much in the second half. I mean, you can look back at some of the numbers that I know that some of the numbers that we have are to people are astronomical and they're like, oh, my gosh, look at these numbers these guys put up and all this stuff. But you, you got to remember, we weren't in a lot of close games. We we were we didn't see the second half a lot of these games on offense. Uh, but Mexico, we saw it was 49-6 at halftime. They shut the scoreboard off. Mexico, we were up there. They shut the scoreboard off. They didn't want any more of that. They, they shut it right off. And I remember him during halftime, Coach Baldoff's like, well, we gave up, and their fans were chirping, and they were yelling stuff, and they were getting all crazy like they won the Super Bowl because they scored six points on us. I have a line. He's like, you know, boys, sometimes you got to be the dog, and sometimes you got to be the tree. So we're going to go out there, these first couple possessions, and we're going to piss on that tree right now. And uh, he, he let us go out there for two series in the second. You know, we scored, of course, first – and it was up to 63, and he called the dogs off. He, you know, everyone ended up playing and the game. And but, but, uh, yeah, we paid for reading the press clippings that week. And, uh, that was the one time I'm gonna say we, we kind of ran it up that game. You know, every other game, you see some of those scores, and we called the dogs off. If it was over, it was over. You know, we, he didn't, we, we never threw on teams when, we were up big. Um, we never, um, we never tried to score, you know, or you call them timeouts and things to try to score late in it. No, we just, everyone got to play and, you know, we, we tried to respect people as much as possible unless, unless they did something to cross us, like turn that scoreboard off. <laughs> <laughs> And like you said, just then the season wrapped up. Like you say, sectional time twenty, you know, twenty-seven nothing over Salve, and then the uh, the win in the dome over VVS thirteen to seven to cap off that first season. What was what was it kind of like though? The tone in practice, you know, like we knew what it was. You know, everybody knew what it was like under Coach Norris all those years. What was it like that first year when you know under Paul Beladoff being the head coach? Uh, it was a little lighter. Things were a little lighter. Uh, it was um it was louder it was um it was it was fun it was uh it all went back to homer football and running the ball and you know being tough up front and and uh doing things the right way we we didn't people think we took the top off things but we didn't we did we only threw the ball 100 times my senior year um they think we we threw the ball all over the lot and it was we did it was it was a little the shift we shifted a little bit more into the passing game um we came up with some different wrinkles and, and the offense changed a little bit in terms of how we opened it up but it, it was just fun and new and it was exciting it was it was it was a fresh start and uh he always referred back to things that that coach would do in, in certain spots and what he would say. And, um, but it was his team. It was definitely his team and we were going to do it, do it the right way. Um, but it, it was very fun and light and 
but we worked hard, man. We, we worked hard. He ran us. He ran us pretty good. There's no team in better shape. I know that. No way they could be in better shape. We, we, ran, we were at the school three days a week on Monday nights. We had passing league up in Syracuse at Griffin Field. We'd go up there and play everyone. Class double A, A, B. It was just wide open. It was seven on sevens. And then Wednesday night, we'd have basketball. So there was no teams in better shape from when we'd started camp. And of course, the interesting part, at least, that was has been the end of the, uh, the Tim Warren era. And ironically, 1,040 passing yards by Dave Medeiros in '85. Yep. There, 16 touchdown passes. That was his career total, which is 11th all time. All his passing came in that in that one season, which you know one year. You know, yep. kind of showed you, but yeah, like you said, there. This was the team that, like we said, set the record for that. Uh, you had the most touchdown catches in a year, uh, 14 in that year. You were 14 catches for, uh, let's see, 14 catches for uh, 34 overall catches, 14 for touchdown, 700 yards total. Um, the number of games that, that year, you had a couple of 84, but a lot of the three-year games from 85 were part of the you know, best single game game efforts. But it's also, well, it also was a decent year as far as a runner as well. You uh as you know, the year Bruce Turner ran for over a thousand yards. Like you said, yeah. this team that threw for a thousand yards and ran for a thousand yards all you know in the same season, and uh, that was that little that good mix. Yeah, because two thousand, yeah, two thousand. You know, when you look at nineteen eighty four, not really anybody much there. They you know, had eight, Jeff Austin eighty two on the list uh, as far as yeah. rest of the seasons, but uh, and then Billy Norris in eighty three, but really not a you know a big runner in eighty four. But then again, there wasn't. Yeah, no one really took over. Like I told you, that line was young in 84. Timmy Warren was a great athlete. He, he went on to Cornell and played baseball over at Cornell. He's a good hockey player, too. We had some good skill positions. Mike Hall was a great athlete. He had nine touchdowns, I believe, that year, too. We just didn't have the big guys up front. They were all young. Like I said, that 84 team, all those studs from the 86, 85 and 86, they got their feet wet in 84. They, they were just getting, they were learning. They were probably in there a year early because my class, my junior class and the senior class didn't have the big guys to do the work. But we had to steal some guys from JV. And by the time they were seniors, we all know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, this, this is, it ends up, you know, this game, the season ends up and, you know, you're still, you know, most touchdown catches in the season 14, most career touchdowns, 24. Mm-hmm. Um, most receptions in the game. Uh, I kind of think it's good. I've seen, you know, I saw Brian, Brandon Simon had to come along and Kane Hartnett. And, uh, but, you know, when you look at the, uh, after Dave Foster in 78, there was a guy in 1980 had seven catches against Cortland. I had to go back and find that one because that wasn't in the record when I started. Larry Brady. Found it. I and was at that the next game. One to, the next one to do was you against VVS. So, I mean, it's kind of, all right, the guy you looked up to, all of a sudden here's, you know, you're right, you know, both right yep. in the same line as a, a reception. Got robbed that night. I don't know if you 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 might not have been around, but Larry's that night he did that in 1980 was down at Randall Field, right in the city of Cortland. They used to play right in the middle of the city at Randall School, and uh, Cortland put one second back on the clock uh, at the end of the game, and they lost. Homer lost on that. That was my when I decided I'm gonna. I'm going to be out there someday. They got robbed. They, I'll never I, – I wish we could have played Cortland just one time when I was in high school. My senior year, they were 0-9. I don't – I think they would have had to call the game off after one point. We got to play it. But, Larry, they got robbed that night. Cortland put a second back on the clock. I'll never forget it. Never <laughs> forget it. My cousin, John Reagan, played for Cortland. They're one of your sponsors, Joe Reagan. No hassle, no razzle dazzle. But his older brother John was on that Cortland team, and he's probably still talking about that night they added that second back on the clock. <laughs> <laughs> the infamous clock game. Oh yeah. <laughs> but also, you finished. You know, you're finished. You know, tied for the most you know receptions in a season with uh, the Dave Foster from the seventy. Mm-hmm. Um, until Zach Hatfield came along and yep. passed, he catches uh, during his seasons. You uh. We're number one, but you're number two at 55, and there's not too many, you know, close to that. So, and like I said, that's what made it fun. I finally went back and was able to do this, you know, the I did this past year. I worked on 
getting more than just uh, your name on the list as far as receiving. We did come up, at least I got like a top 15 now, but uh, yeah, but still, you know, 55 catches, you know, 100 and, you know, 1,132 yards is still mm-hmm. that's a 21 yard average per yep. catch. And then we said, like you said, 24 touchdowns out of, uh, you know, 55 like touchdowns. That's uh that's kind of something that when you look back now, that's something that really that hang your head on that. That's still, that's around, that's still there. Yeah. What's that? 40 years ago, 35, 40 years ago. Yep. I, we, we used to run some plays called three special and four special. And uh, we started that in 11th grade and they kind of let me do my thing. I would either, if the guy was playing too far off me, I would, I would curl it up at about 15 yards. And, uh, if I was even with them, I was to go deep. And uh, nine times out of 10, I was going deep. Then if I got behind you, good things happen for, for Homer. Um, had two great quarterbacks. I, I can't ask for it. I mean, they're, they're in the record books. You can see I, 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 I got lucky. I was with two great quarterbacks. We had a great running game. And uh, – what I would do is I'd just run sprints all the, the entire game. Didn't really block anyone too much, but sure enough, I would just raise my hands up a little bit like I was going to stock block someone, and they, they'd come up or, or stop freezing their tracks, and I was behind them. Once I got behind you, it was kind of like we talked about yesterday. When Jaden Gavidian would get behind you, it was over. And I think that's the way it was for me too. I mean um, – we, we had some great team speed. I will tell you that some, some phenomenal team speed on uh, those teams in 80, 85. And again, those guys had it in 86. We had some guys out there running, you know, you, you see some of these times at the combines, but we had guys running four sixes, four sevens. I, I, I think Dave Pratt and myself might've got down in the four high four fives. Um, four, five, eight, four, five, nine. And uh, I saw Mike Jasper one time run a, run a four, six, nine. Carl Demery had the, had the watch tight end at Dartmouth. It's myself, Mike Jasper, Dave Medeiros out at the track and Homer, when they put the new track in, we're all in college. Now we're going to go out and run some forties and uh, Carl's not going to run the forties because Carl was a great athlete, but he couldn't really, he wasn't the fastest guy in the world, but he, you know, he, he played tight on the Dartmouth and he was a great athlete, but I saw Mike Jasper run a four, six, nine 40 at 230 pounds. So, uh, that's the type of athlete that was there in those days. Uh, Dave Mendaris was running four sixes consistently. I busted a four or five something that day. And, uh, we ran to, we, but I'll never forget it. I was like, he's going to kill someone at Kobe when he gets there. He, he did some, he, we had, we had a lot of great, a lot of studs, a lot of studs, good old days. Yeah. I've been, I've, I've messaged back and forth with Dave, with Mike a few times and he doesn't seem to want to, what was the past was the past. He doesn't seem to want to come back and relive some of his, uh, his good days between his days at Colgate and at Homer. He's just kind of like. He's in his own world out there in Clinton. I think he still works for Colgate. He's like a head of facilities or something yeah. out there for them. So, yeah, so I haven't been able to talk Mike into coming on yet, but uh, hopefully me, I'll keep working on another. Fan Patton Patton can get him to come on. That was his, that was his sidekick, those two at linebacker. That's a scary thing. That's a scary thing. Dirk can get him. Dirk Van Patton can probably get him to come on if you get talking to him. Yeah, well, Dirk, yeah, Dirk's another one I'm going to get on because, I mean, I did Andy last year because his son graduated and, yeah. You know, Unfortunately, I got robbed that senior year. He might have, you know, put you know put some numbers up to, with Charlie. Oh, yeah. He, he did he get missed, robbed? He missed Bob Avery because he only got three games. He just missed Bob Avery for a second and maybe could have put a scare into what uh, Alec Bush did, you know, you know later. Dirk's my time. cousin. We went to St. Lawrence together. Dirk, Dirk and I went to St. Lawrence together. I saw him make about 15 tackles in a row one time in a scrimmage at St. Lawrence. Uh, and guys are looking up looking over at me I was like hey you, you guys have no idea he, he he took on the biggest guy on our team he was a tough hard-nosed player man he took on this guy that was like 6'5 305 
Dirk's like 200 pounds soaking wet. And, you know, he's slugging it out with this guy in the middle of practice. Like, it, Dirk took over a scrimmage one time up at St. Lawrence, and I'll never he, – he, I swear he made, like, 15 straight tackles in a row. And guys were like, what is going on? Because he had transferred from Oswego. He's a baseball player, and he hadn't played football since 86. Since that 86 year, he, he had – and he transferred into St. Lawrence, and he, he didn't miss a beat. I can tell you that. Tough kid. <laughs> yeah, so like I said, you know, I was going like, yeah, could there ever have been, uh, uh, was there ever another, like, so I said, I don't have anything from nine, before 1990 to, to build career numbers off of, which I kind of hope I can maybe get around and be able to do that at some point. But uh, I was shocked when I did finally put some other numbers together and, you know, like Jaden Davidian missed a thousand yards by two. He had 998 receiving yards. Yeah. And we said the guy passed you in career receptions, Zach Hatfield, had 957. Mm-hmm. Again, you're the only three with, you know, over 900 yards receiving in Homer history. And then there's Michael Carboyne at 807. But, uh, but yeah, no, yeah, it was never a big – passing has never been a part of Homer. But to, to see, you know, four you know four guys with over 800 yards, and, again, you, you're, you're, you're standing the test of time, and, you know, you may stand the test of time forever because I don't know if there will ever be a team that will – you know, Joey Rivers too for a lot of yards. And like I said, he worked with, you know, guys, you know, and put up some, you know, good numbers and had some of those guys are among his receivers, but it's not, uh, you're in a, you're a very unique place. So that's got to make you, you know, kind of when you look back at things that special that uh, that's still you as uh, the king. Oh, it's, 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 it, I look back and I'm just like, this things are still there. It's still, it's still up there. And it was a perfect storm. Like we talked about yesterday. There was so many really, really, really good athletes in that school at one time that it, I don't know if it – I don't know if it's going to happen again. Um, it's different now. Um, kids are steering away from – some kids are steering away from football because of the concussion stuff. And we just had so many kids at the same time. And we, we worked hard at it. We went to passing leagues up in Syracuse and, you know, we, we'd be playing, playing against all the big schools, all the double A's, A's, you know, every year in 84 and 85, we scrimmaged FM and West Jenny. That was our, that was our introduction to the season. Both years is we'd go against a double A school for our preseason scrimmage. And then, get whooped all over the field and thrown around. And then, you know, the first game of the year, we'd go out and there's Jordan Elbridge, a, a class B school, you know? So we, we get knocked down a couple pegs, but uh, yeah, it feels good. It, it feels great. And I, I appreciate everything that uh, the community did for me. There's nothing better than uh, like Larry said, when he talked it was a Friday in Homer, man, there's nothing better than that is when you throw that, blue and white jersey on or that white on and wear your jersey to school and you just want to go out there and make the people proud and and uh hear those fans erupt and you know you come to this you come look out there and that whole parking lot's packed and they're all up and down what is that central center street or I can't remember the street right outside but they'd be all the way down there and uh just rocking it, it some of the best memories of my life are uh, out there on Butts Field, to be honest with you. And I just, I'm lucky, I'm blessed that, that some of those numbers are still up there. Sometimes I think back, though, and I wish we would have been in a couple close games. Might have been able to get out there in the second half. We never saw the second half. We, we were usually first, second quarter, and we were done. That was it. No, he didn't want – he coach, they, they let everyone play, which is the right thing to do. You know, you got these teams out there running scores up, going crazy and letting guys get numbers. And we weren't about that. We had to get ready for the next year. And it's still this 85 team, when you look at the uh, a team put up, you know, 2,464 yards, that's still among the top five all time to 3,596 total yards. I think it's still like number three all time. And, the 52 touchdowns is still like tied for, I think, tied for third. Mm-hmm. Tied for third with total number of touchdowns scored in the season. So, I mean, so that 85 team set a blueprint 
that really only until, you know, we got into these, uh, ch you know, championship runs, you know, 2005, you know, put up, uh, no, 2004, the sectional champions put up, you know, some of the big numbers. And then even this team put up, you know, that went this year, put up, you know, the 62, to you know, touchdown second highest to the 2014 team. And uh, so, I mean, it's, you got, like I said, this was the start, like I said, of six sectional championships and then le which led to a state championship the next year. But that's that blueprint of what you guys put together as one that still all these other Homer teams continue to, you know, look, you know, the pace now to be, you know, be where they are now. Yes, sir. Um, they, uh, coach Basilek was a, has done phenomenal. I can't believe you told me he's been there as long as coach Norris was. So congrats to coach Basilek. He was, uh, he was a grad assistant when I think from court, did he go to Cortland State? I think, I can't remember, but he, he was like just out of college and he was helping us out and he'd help out with like scouting and things. Like 83, I think was his, his start. And uh, he's still there and he's carried on the tradition. And I think, think it all goes back to Coach Norris with working hard in the summer, working hard in the weight room, and Homer never gets away from that 56, 55 boom, those off tackle plays. And uh, that's the bread and butter. It's just hard nosed, tough football. And uh, he's carried it on and he's, he's done a phenomenal job and the program is just rolling. People know about, people know about Homer football. When I went to college, they, they would always come up and ask me, man, what was it like growing up? I'm like, it's nothing better. There's nothing better than growing up in Homer. You have no idea. On a Friday night, and the whole town is there. You could go rob every house in Homer on a Friday night. <laughs> I, you could have you could have took everyone that night of our final game, man. There must not have been a soul in that town. Everyone was at the dome, but the great town, a great program, three coaches in what fifty some years? You said it's 1954. There's three coaches. If those, if the kids there. I just, I'd like to put it out there that they, they got to realize how lucky they are to grow up in a, in a town like Homer and uh, a town that supports a team like that. And uh, just keep putting in the work in the summers when they don't want to do it, do it when no one's watching, you know, that's, that's what builds championships is when you put in that work, when, there's no fans when there's no crowd, when no one's telling you to do it, go to the school, go to go up there and run on the track, go to the weight room when no one, when no one's asking you to, because that town, that town lives for that, those Friday nights and they need to uh, keep this thing rolling and remember how luck, a lot of them won't go on to college and that's their, that's their whole, their whole thing. And they got to step back and realize that, it's 35 years ago now, and and uh, I still think back to how great it was and just cherish it. Work hard, do the right thing, and, and just soak it all in because it goes by real fast. And uh, if there's one thing I can say about the, the people of Homer, they do love their football, and they'll do anything to support that team. So go make them proud, boys. <laughs> Speaking of Coach Bitsy, like I know you'll probably hate me for bringing this back up again, but uh -oh. I remember it got brought up one time, and you kind of let the cat out of the bag when we were just talking on the phone yesterday. That uh, yeah, yep, uh, Shirley was born with a 1984 team. Yep, he was. It, it, it all started. Oh man, back in the day, Coach Bitsy like had a had a big head of curly blonde hair. I don't know what, I, I don't think he still has it, but he had that big poofy blonde curls. And uh, I, I want to say it was, it was Tracy Wright and Grant Ganino from the 83 team that uh, lost in the sectional finals to Holland Patton. They gave him that name, that label. Mike Hall might've been involved in that too. And it kind of took off from there. They called him Shirley after Shirley Temple, the, the, the actress and dancer with the big poofy blonde ha hairdo. And uh, he, uh, he was, he was good natured with it and he was young and he took it out on the field. He was fine with it as long as it was on that practice field. But I do remember a couple of times where 
people uh, unleashed the Shirley call in the school a couple of times uh, in the lobby of the high school. And uh, I remember Dave Medeiros, one of the greatest players of all time in Homer football history, barked it out a couple of times and down the hallway to him. And uh, I remember Coach Basilic yanking him down the office and they had a little discussion about, uh, you know, out in the field is one thing, but not in the school in front of the other students. He didn't, he didn't take kindly to that, but that's when it all started. He, he probably won't admit it, but I don't think the boys probably call him that anymore. But back in the day, we got away with it. Only out on the field, though. He, he took it out there. Not, not inside the school. Don't bring it in the building. <laughs> well, like you say, you're, you're amazed that he's been there that long. And think about it. He was a guy that was just, you know, a couple of years ahead of you, Tom Cottrell, you know, played. And oh, he, yeah. he's been an assistant coach for over 30 years now. I mean, he's been at Homer you know, 25 well, 25, between 25 and 30 years, I believe it is, that him and Coach P have been together as coaches. That's that amazing. The- that is absolutely amazing. Tommy Cottro, number 13, played linebacker and I think fullback. I know that uh, that 83 team that, that lost in the finals, I was in 10th grade and uh, I used to get in trouble. Um, we'd, we'd be scout teams. Our JV team was undefeated, and we were scout team for them. And um, Coach Belladoff would play quarterback. And uh, when we put – if they are going against a passing team, he would play quarterback And you know, in, in the scrimmages. We'd scrimmage the varsity. And him and I did some serious work against that uh, varsity team. And I used to get in trouble for going all out. I – I, I I did pretty well in those scrimmages. I'm not going to lie. You know, I did have a grown man playing quarterback for me. But if you go back and that, I used to get scolded by Billy Norris and Tom Cottrell and Gus, all, all the seniors, because, you know, you're going all out. You're making us look bad in practice. They'd make them run plays over and over and over and over again. If, if it was successful, Coach Norris would yeah, they didn't like that too much, but I can't believe they've been together that long. That's amazing. <laughs> um, any other lasting memories you can think of that, you know, stick out? You know, you, you kind of went to where I was going to go. I think about, you know, the fact that you got to wear the jersey, you know, in, in school and stuff and what that meant. And of course, and like, especially like you said, you guys were the guys that were became the template that set, set up that first state championship and did get the first sectional title. Any, you know, are there any memories like that that stick out with you that just kind of, you know, you think of fondly when you look back at your days at Homer? I, I can, um, I can safely say that, um, you know, I went on, I had some success in college and, and, um, did some good things. I think my senior year of college, I, was like 34 catches, 600 yards, eight touchdowns, and we were okay. And, you know, we were maybe seven and three, but there's nothing like those, those, the, the camaraderie and growing up with that group of kids. We were together all the time. Um, just the conversations and the, and the, um, the work that people don't understand went on during the summers and the togetherness and and just the camaraderie and wanting to do it for each other in the community um it it was such a it was such a great time in in life and just some of the guys I miss them dearly and like I told you before um these kids, they need to cherish this time because it, it's going to go fast and they're going to look back and want it back. Just remember um, to do it for each other. And there's one thing when we were in that dome, I remember our halftime and looking around in there and it, we were down seven, nothing at half and we'd never been behind and we'd never, we, we'd never lost obviously, but We'd never even been behind in a game that senior year. And uh, maybe the Mexico game, which that doesn't count. We rolled them up 60-something. But just looking around at each other and 
and some of the speeches in that that locker room at halftime, some of the things that were said and you know about this is it. We've never this this town is you know we've never had an undefeated season. We can't let the people down. You know, let's do it for each other. Let's do it for all those fans out there. And and um, I'm just glad that we could do it and start the tradition or start the role. Coach Norris started the tradition, but I'm glad we could do it for the town and the people because their support. We couldn't have done it without all their support and and uh, all the car rides and and driving us to the places and all those big crowds at the away games. Um, some of the things that went on at halftime of that, that dome game in that locker room, we weren't going to let the people down. And I'm just glad that it all worked out. And like I said earlier in the show is uh, things would be a lot different if I didn't catch that ball. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jim, we want to thank you for taking time. Uh, so this, like I said, it was nice for me, you know, being you know around the football team 22 years myself now, you know, finally put a, a, a face and a voice to the uh, all-time receiving uh, career, receiving yards guy. Awesome. So, Jim, it was a lot of fun that you could uh, take time and talk to us today. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Go Blue. Thank you. <laughs> and that will do it for this edition of Trojan Football Talk. Again, today's show brought to you by American Credit Union for every day, for everything. Located next to Little Caesars at 3944 Route 281 in Cortland. By the Cortland Voice, the exclusive media partner of Trojan Football Talk. For all your local news and sports in Cortland County at no cost to you, check out CortlandVoice.com. By the Royal Auto Group on Route 281 in Homer, in Cortland, excuse me, the home of no hassle, no razzle dazzle. Check them out at RoyalAutoGroup.com. By Yeaman Real Estate at the entrance to Yeaman Park off I-81, exit 11 in Cortland. By DJ Philly C, make your wedding party or event extra special with the best DJ in the area. Contact DJ Philly C at 607-745-4346. By Nikki C's Hometown Pizzeria and Meatball Shop on Route 281 next to Hobos in Homer. Find them online for fast, secure ordering or call 607-749-5300. They have a unique menu with dietary specific options. Nikki C's, your grab and go specialist. By Graftex, located on Elm Street in Cortland. Founded in 1984, they provide custom screen printing and embroidery for teams and local businesses. Graftex continues its dedication to servicing customers' needs for innovative graphic designs, custom imprinted apparel, and quality service. They are easy to contact at 1-800-417-7791. By Seven Valley Agency at 18 Tompkins Street in Cortland for all your personalized insurance services. Give them a call at 607-753-1821 or check them out online at 7valleyagency.com. 7 Valley Agency, where your money matters, our advice counts. By Isaac Merker Studio, handling all your photographic needs in Central New York since 1982 at 74 Hamlin Street in Cortland. Give them a call at 607-756-0849, or check them out online at isaacmerker.com or on their Facebook page. By M&D Deli, located on Central Avenue in Cortland, open Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. till 3 p.m. M&D has breakfast sandwiches, bakery items, and daily lunch specials. They are also available for catering. Check out their Facebook page for more information. Stop by or call 607-753 to go. That's 753-8646. And look for their new food truck in the spring of 2022. By Crop Growers LLP, the first choice in crop insurance located in Homer, Contact KC Slate at 607-591-2460 for more information. And by the First National Bank of Dryden at 12 South Main Street in Homer. Safe, secure, and locally owned for all your banking needs. For more information, stop by, call 662-4179, or check them out online at drydenbank.com. So once again, great time with our guest, the all-time receiving yards leader, in Homer, Jim Curry, and yours truly, Tom Vartanian. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you again soon.